Am I on? Hi. Yep. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Facebook Live. I'm uh, Annette Mercantant, Dr. Annette Mercantant from the St. Clair County Health Department. And we're here today, as every day on Thursdays at 3.30, to answer your questions and to go through some of the more uh, recent changes with COVID, the ever-present COVID. Okay, so for our data today, uh, we have a total of 19,580 cases with close to 19,000 recovered. Um, you do that math really quickly, that's about 11% of the population that we know of that's had a natural infection. We've had over 800 hospitalizations and 437 deaths. Next slide. Oh, and our percent positivity now is over 10%. Or, or, we were up a little bit, 11%, then 9%, but I would say about 10.5% is seems to be where we're at right now. So, okay. Next slide. And then this is our epigraph. It's changed a little bit because we're using seven-day averages now, right, instead of total cases. That's how you change that. Oh, that's okay. And that's helpful. So you also notice that we removed the 2020 uh, cases. So you can see just pretty much what's happened since, uh, does that start? I can't even see it from there. And that's January 1. So it gives you a little bit of a better idea of what would just uh, has happened in this past um, year. So there we are on the right hand side uh, with the slow uh, incline that um, doesn't seem to be accelerating. So we're going to watch this closely. A lot of things obviously change in the fall. People go inside. we got kids at school. And uh, we'll be uh, watching this very, very closely over the next couple of weeks uh, to see uh, which uh, direction we may be going in. Next slide. And then this is our data on vaccinations. We have um, at least 50, we have 53% of the population having at least one vaccine. And for completed vaccination status, it's 49.5%. So just a little under 50%. Again, a lot of variation between age groups with our lowest vaccination rate in our 12 to 15 year old groups, which obviously puts um, our school age children again um, in um, front and center as far as the area that we're most concerned about. Then we have on the bottom some um, weekly graphs on first and second doses. The orange top of the bar is the first dose. Bottom bar is second doses. And the good news with this, as you can see, every week we are still providing anywhere from four to 500 first new doses to individuals in the community. So uh, people are still kind of changing their mind, getting out, getting that vaccine. And I ask for all of you who've been fully vaccinated to reach out to somebody you love or you know and talk to them about maybe when it's going to be time. The sooner this happens, <clears throat> the safer we're all going to be. And finally, our next graph is kind of a uh, a snapshot of our, our dashboard. We update it regularly. You can see um, the trends. Um, there's a lot of links in there if you're if you're a numbers person, and we'll uh, continue to keep that updated and available to you. Along, by the way, with a lot of great information on our website. Um, while we talk about website, I want to we're going to talk a little bit about some of our revisions this this week and all of those details are on our website including links to the resources that we used to get this information. So the big news for this week of course is that uh, we have revised our quarantine orders. Um, the health department uh, released quarantine order to make sure people know that quarantine is important and we take it seriously. Remember, isolation is when an individual is ill or is positive for COVID and they need to um, stay home for 10 days. And that is true whether they're vaccinated or unvaccinated. But if you are exposed to an individual who's positive and that exposure is considered high risk, which means within six feet for at least 15 minutes, then we've asked, we will ask you to quarantine. And up until now, quarantine has been ideally 14 days with a 10 day option. And um, there has always been a seven-day option on the books through the CDC with a test out on day five. And so we have adopted that formally to try and give people a little more latitude. Uh, what that means is that if you are in quarantine, we are going to ask you to stay home 
for seven days. But after day five, if you get a test, a negative test, you can return um, to your place of employment or school uh, with ongoing monitoring and ideally a face mask to continue to protect you for those and others around you for the remaining time of your quarantine. quarantine. So uh, this is um, an update that is a applicable to everyone in the county, not just students. And the, you'll find those details again on our website. Um, another detail of uh, this order um, may or may not apply to our schools because it's dependent on them using mitigation strategies like masks, okay? So if a school is not using masks and most of the individuals in the classroom are unmasked, then it's a mute point. Then they continue to use a 10-day or a seven day with a test out strategy for quarantine. However, if some of our schools um, or, or um, decide that it's time to get the masks on, or if we go there as a community, then um, that will allow us uh, to provide another um, leniency for quarantine that has been approved by the state. And that is a person who's been exposed where everybody is masked, because we believe that significantly reduces the risk of transmission, they'll be allowed to continue in school with close monitoring and daily testing. So there's layers of protection there, but again, the point is to try and keep our kids in school as much as possible and, and, and balance that risk of infection and transmitting infection with the importance of in-school learning and all the problems that occur when we keep kid, uh, giving kids uh, to, leaving them to go home. So uh, you'll find those details on our website. Um, there's a lot of uh, if this, then that, and we'll have an algorithm that'll kind of help you walk through it. I know it's complicated, but this is complicated. Science is complicated. Um, fighting a virus, um, if you haven't figured it out, is pretty darn complicated. So we'll continue to shift uh, when we when we get more information that seems valid and we're always looking for ways to improve um, the health of our community, not only against the virus, but the economic and the mental health and all the other things that are going along with this for so long now. Okay, Jen, right. ready for questions? I am. I just wanted to welcome everybody and let you all know we changed our process for questions that we normally let people ask the night before. We are now asking people if you have questions before our show to submit them to COVID-19 at stclaircounty.org. So these questions I'm going to be reading are ones that were submitted last night. Okay, Doc, question number one that came in and then we'll, we'll do the live questions as we normally do. The first person asked, I was wondering how effective it is for my daughter to wear a mask in a classroom of about 20 students when she is the only one keeping hers on. How well is she protected? Also, do you think you will be putting in a mask mandate for preschool to 12th grade soon if positive cases continue to rise? Thank you so much. So as you know, the mass data is out there. As more data comes in, it becomes more and more obvious that masks do help. It varies a great deal on the study, but any mask wearing is helpful. Of course, it would be way more helpful if everybody was masked. We know that that's the ideal situation. So make sure that your daughter is wearing a well-fitted mask. Um, there was some recent, some literature that came out that suggested uh, paper masks or the surgical mask um, might be a little bit more effective. Double masking, if she can tolerate it, is sometimes an option too, where you wear the paper mask with a cloth mask over it. But regardless, um, it's hard to say exactly how protected she is. So just, um, you know, continue to educate on trying to keep her distance, making sure that there's good hand washing and we're gonna hope for the best. So the question for the mask mandate really boils down to that. Uh, we are watching this like a hawk. So we have our eyes on the data and we're watching how cases pile up. If they begin to accelerate, and the acceleration appears to be not primarily community fed, but fed by in-school transmission. And there are a number of ways we can look at that, quarantine rates, outbreak rates, um, you know, ongoing transmission rates. That will be our trigger um, to uh, move forward with more stringent 
mitigation factors. And we're not going to sit idly by why more and more kids get sick. So um, you have our word on that, but we are going to be watching the data to see what happens. If in fact um, it doesn't matter, as some people think, then maybe it won't matter. Maybe our cases will stay low and and everything will be hunky dory and fine, and we'll just kind of keep doing our thing. So far, I do want to share that um, we continue to strongly recommend masking schools. As you know, there's currently no mandate. We will watch this data closely. But as of today, uh, we have um, uh, four K through 12 schools, and they're both between their public and private that have a total of five infected students. So again, not a huge rate of, of infection in our schools. Of course, it's just the first week, but you know, that's good news. Um, these five infected students have resulted in 27 quarantines with our current quarantine policies in place. So again, not terrible. Uh, but these are the kinds of things we'll be watching. Um, these numbers are very similar to what we saw last spring. Are they not? Yeah. So last spring when the rates were coming down. So that's the kind of thing that we'll be looking at and reporting out on. And, of course, um, uh, we'll let you know when, when things change or if things change. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the next question is, why are the schools not masking but the buses are? Children went, that went back to school in Tennessee are sick from Delta. Just wondering with high rates here, why children are not asked to mask in class? Um, well, it goes back to now. Um, there's all kinds of what's, you know, all the pushback, what's required, what's recommended. Um, and then I'll just say, we'll finish up what's best, okay? The best thing for you to do is to have your kid and you mask when you are in an enclosed indoor space with other people who aren't your people, your pod, right? Your immediate family, okay? That is the best way to do that. Um, and that's what I'm starting to do. Um, I'm not seeing a whole lot of masks out there yet, but um, people, it's time, okay? It's time to take care of yourselves and make those decisions for yourself. Um, the question about schools, though, is there is a CDC uh, federal regulation, and we it has been interpreted as a requirement from the federal level to wear buses on public, or excuse me, wear masks in public transportation spaces. So buses, school buses are considered public transportation. And so that is why masks are required on school buses. So there you go with that. And we're hoping that people will comply. Now, obviously, kids are going to sit a lot closer. Another thing to do on school buses, though, is keep those windows open. Ventilation has been shown to be more very important with transmission. So as much as possible, you want those windows open. Okay. Okay. Um, the next person asked, how concerned should we be about the Mu variant? <clears throat> how concerned should we be about all these variants so we were all worried about the alpha variant remember and now we got delta which is way more contagious and it's causing more trouble by the way we know that the delta variant is absolutely more contagious um, however the level of severity is still under question it's it, it appears that it's not really more severe it's just a lot more people get infected. So if you have 10% of the population get infected, um, who, excuse me, 10% of those infected who have, who are severe. So if 100 people get infected, that's 10 people. But if suddenly you have 1,000 people getting infected, that same 10% is 100 people. So you can see, well, there's a lot more, which is what we believe is driving up some of the pediatric admissions in other parts of the country. It's not that the Delta uh, variant um, causes more severe infection. There's just a lot more people getting infected, including a lot more kids. So uh, this is where we really want to focus on um, through this next surge. No, the mu, the mu, the lambda. So the more this virus has a chance to replicate in people's bodies, the more its DNA is going to uh, recombine recom and genetic mutations are going to occur. It's the nature of this virus. So the way to stop mutations and variants from plaguing us and creating issues with um, resistance to vaccine or resistance to treatment is to not allow it to replicate. That means stop transmission. That means vaccinating. That means masks. That means staying in when you have been exposed. Okay. So all the tools we have could do this. We could do this. 
um, the real question is, are we going to choose to do this? And if we don't choose to do this, if we allow um, millions and billions of replications to occur through every surge, um, I guarantee you we will see more variants, unfortunately. All right. So, Doc, the next question this person had listed out and wanted some numbers. So I'm going to read you each one and you can just um, say the number. So they asked, okay. what is the total number of vaccinated in Michigan? So Michigan has 5,364,544 individuals who've received at least one dose. That is 66.3% of the population. Okay, the next question, total number of vax in St. Clair County. So we've had 73,580 vaccinations or 53% of our county vaccinated with at least one dose. We talked about that at the beginning. So we are under vaccinated relative to um, many parts of the state. The next question was, what is the total number of breakthrough cases? Okay, so um, through from June 1st through August 25th, there were 183 breakthrough cases per 100,000. Um, that's compared to about 582 cases per 100,000 for people who are vaccinated, excuse me, who are unvaccinated. So unvaccinated. Um, considerably more people vaccinated, uh, sorry, considerably more unvaccinated people who are getting infected than those who are vaccinated. And we'll continue right, to watch those. Mm -hmm. The next question was, what is the total number of hospitalizations from breakthrough cases? So the number of hospitalizations through breakthrough uh, cases, again, uh, just from June 1st to August 25th, is 10.4 breakthrough cases per 100,000 um, in the vaccinated group versus 23 hospitalizations per 100,000 for those unvaccinated. So um, it's double the vaccine double the hospitalizations for unvaccinated individuals that are ho to be hospitalized. And the Twice last data, much. last data mm -hmm. point they asked was, what is the total number of deaths from breakthrough cases? Okay. So there was, I hate when you put 1.5 deaths, like how do you have a half a death? That's data for you people. So there's 1.5 deaths per 100,000 in people uh, in breakthrough cases. So people who were vaccinated who got sick, there's about one and a half deaths per 100,000. This compares to uh, seven and a half deaths, actually 7.6 deaths per 100,000 associated with unvaccinated individuals. So again, there is seven times the death rate in unvaccinated individuals from COVID than for vaccinated individuals. So every way we look at this, and this is true for every, in fact, I'm going to be reviewing some recent data with our, our local doctors tonight. Um, every study, every way we look at this, every methodology, there is clear evidence that vaccines markedly reduce infection rates, um, hospitalization rates, and death rates. Now, the variants are going to have an impact on that. The Delta's had an impact, but the vaccines that we have are still highly effective against uh, these conditions, and they're still well worth getting. All right. So now we're going to move to the live questions. The first question comes from Heather. She said, I saw a letter from Allegan County threatening parents of an infected child with CPS, et cetera, if they didn't do everything they tell them to do. Would our county handle it that way also? It seems extreme. So that came and we have, we had a similar letter that we have revised and, and softened the language. This is standard language extracted from the public health code as far as how you handle a communicable disease in an individual who's non-compliant. So there is the possibility of, of, of using um, um, ticketing or um, in, in severe cases, uh, I'll give you an example, a, a TB patient that's refusing treatment and refusing um, to stand doors where you can take that person into protective cu custody and make sure that they're no longer a threat to other people. So that language was in uh, a letter. It, I, I'll be honest with you, it was in our letters for years, for decades. Um, but in the case of COVID, where the infectious period is, as we mentioned, um, seven to 14 days, where we're talking about children, no one is going to come to your house and remove somebody uh, and to put them in protective custody because um, you're refusing to quarantine. So the language is strong. It, it's, it's 
technically correct, but we're going to revise that. And um, the language now will just extract from the public health code that we do have the authority that we mean business. Um, if Honestly, if we find noncompliance to be really egregious and it's causing a lot of difficulties in a community, um, I think we would resort more to ticketing um, and, and using um, that process of fines to to enforce it. But no, nobody's going to come to your house and remove you from your home uh, for being noncompliant with the COVID um, quarantine or isolation. I just want to echo something, Doc, that you said too. So recently on our website, we put on our front page the FAQs. And in the FAQs for COVID, there is a whole legal section. So if people right. click on that link, they can see from our county attorney and his partners exactly um, the legal uh, components of what we're doing. What They're we're all allowed to do there. and what we're not allowed to do. And let me just say this in the how many years have I been here, Jen? 12 now, something like that, 13. Um, there, there have only been a couple of really extreme cases where we've really even considered um, enforcement of something like this. You know, that's that's on the books for, but for a, for a pandemic like this, where entire communities are being impacted, well, our goal here is just compliance. Our goal is just make as many people um, follow the rules as possible because the rules were made to protect you and to protect each other. So um, the, the focus is not to be punitive and heavy handed. Uh, we're sorry if that letter came across being heavy handed um, and we'll, we'll soften the tone. But the idea is that you do the right thing and, and you follow our advice because our advice is solid. Okay, thank you. Uh, for mm -hmm. those of you who have come in late and ask repeat questions, we do a time stamping of this show and put it on our YouTube channel. So you can watch over again and everything will be categorized out. Okay, um, the next question uh, from Jennifer. I don't understand why tech and SE4 are requiring masks and Port Huron area schools are not. I know. So school districts have the ability to require masks um, just like Tech does, and just like SC4 does, different schools have weighed in on this. They have um, boards of boards of education. Um, they have various things to consider, and they're all struggling with this issue. Um, all I can say is that um, all of them are working hard to keep their environment as safe as possible, and we're going to try and assist them as best as we can. Um, by moving forward with what whatever we have to move forward with. So um, this is hard on a lot of people. There's a lot of components at, at play here. If, you, if, if you're not paying attention to what's going on uh, throughout the state and throughout the country regarding this, then you're not looking. OK, um, this is this is way bigger than a public health issue. I wish it was just about public health. Our lane is public health. So I will continue to advance and support public health measures that we know and believe to be appropriate and work. Um, schools, on the other hand, are not public health people. They're not they're not there to promote health. They have a lot of things to consider with education and uh, teaching and the well-being of their students. So um, I wouldn't throw them under the bus. I know they're all trying really hard. And I believe that we'll all get through this together by working uh, together as best as we can. Okay, the next question is from Barbie. She said, if my son is 11 in November and the vaccines are available in November, but his birthday is in December, will he be getting the lower dose for his first dose and his second dose after he turns 12, be the 30 milligram dose? I'm wondering if it's best to wait until he turns 12 at this point. Yeah, Barbie, I'm sorry. I wish I could be a little bit help, more helpful with pediatric doses, but that, that those studies just haven't been... Um, published. I haven't been able to read them. Um, I really don't know. Um, there will be guidance for that, though. I will tell you there will be some best practices. There'll probably be a little gray area. But in general, we, we vaccinate based on age uh, at the time of the vaccine that's provided. So you get the, the vaccine dosage uh, that you need at that age, um, regardless if you're going to turn the next day a different age. So I would say let, let's give this a little time to settle down. We'll have a lot more information and there'll probably be a little bit better opportunities um, to guide you uh, when the time comes. 
and that that'll be a, a probably a really great question to review with your doctor um but no none of us have really solid um evidence right now um this is all caught up in the regulatory approval process at the fda okay um just going through this is from Sue. She asked, how many variants are out there and what are they called? Wow. How many? We tracked four variants of concern, alpha, beta, gamma. Here. So in St. Clair County, we have been notified specifically of four variants of concern. So if you go to the CDC page, you can find these all. There are variants of concern, variants of interest, and then variants of grave concern is there was there's even a one higher than the ones we have and they're all listed as far as um what they are and where they came from and what the prevalence is uh, honestly there are dozens of them dozens of them um so i if you're interested in that i would i would certainly encourage you to go to the cdc site there's some really great interactive um uh, pages there to look at the next um, comment is from Sandy. She said, the information doctor is giving right now should be published and announced. It shows that vaccination is markedly reducing rates and taking burden off the hospitals. Thank you. It, it is published and announced all the time. Maybe you're just not listening to the right thing. <laughs> um, go to our website. Uh, look at the MDHS website. I mean, really, if, if you Google vaccine, a COVID vaccine efficacy, um, you'll just see tons of of literature and papers and and things. It's it's out there, people. There's there's you know, if if you think vaccines are deadly and they don't work, my 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 comment to you is you're looking in the wrong place. You're looking at bad information because uh, that's not uh, what we know. Okay, so. Um, I said something to somebody. It's like, oh, there's just too much misinformation out there. People don't know. What the you, people are smart. Yes, yes, you do. You can figure this out. This information is everywhere. Um, and people are working really hard to communicate this in many different ways. So if you don't know about it, um, you need to just look a little harder. And I'm sorry if I'm sounding a little snarky. Maybe I'm feeling a little snarky. Uh, but misinformation can only be swallowed if you allow it to be. Um, I, I really encourage everybody to continue to keep your minds open and look at the information from a much broader perspective because um, there's 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 no question that some of this stuff that we're talking about is, is solid and irrefutable. And if, if you're just hanging on to some of these fears, it's because um, you haven't looked for, for other answers. Or looking at the wrong information. Okay, this is from... Um, on June, I think is how you say it. Uh, we have friends in another Southeast Michigan County, and we have been surprised to see that in each COVID case we know of, the entire household ended up coming down with COVID. No one was spared, vaccinated or unvaccinated, although some cases were mild and some more severe. Is this a trend you have noticed too, where entire households come down with it? So we haven't really reached that kind of level yet, although um, it wouldn't surprise me. We know that the Delta variant is very contagious. And so it's much more likely to spread through an entire household. There's always interesting, it's always interesting where one person's spirit and another was one's not. Um, anecdotally, we do know that people um, in entire households are, are, are spreading it. Um, if you look for it, you'll find it. Don't forget that we still believe a significant number of people who get infected are asymptomatic. Um, so if you don't have symptoms and you're in a household, it may be prudent to test, um, especially kind of early on when the peak uh, viral uh, replication is occurring about days three to five. So that is um, something just to keep in mind. Um, this is not anything to uh, blow off. People, I've said this before, there's a reason why we've been working night and day for the last 18, 19 months on this, as this virus is brutal. Um, and every time it changes, it, it brings it brings down a, a lot of good people. So we'll keep All track right. of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is from Lauren. She asks, okay, what's the percentage of vaccinated compared to total positive cases? A vaccinated, can you do that one? Vaccinated to total positive case. Percentage of vaccinated compared to total positive cases. 
I'm not sure what that would show. Vaccinated. We know that percent vaccinated in the population. And we know how many positive cases have been vaccinated. We shared that information with you. So I'm not sure what else we can do. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay. So total positive cases we know, right? Total positive cases currently, maybe that's what she's asking for. It's less than a percent, he said. Yeah, and that's true. When we do that data, usually anytime I look at it, and that's what the state's saying as well, the less than 1% of the uh, uh, positive COVIDs um, are vaccinated. The problem is we're getting a lot more cases. So you're going to see a lot more vaccinated individuals with cases because we're just getting a lot more cases, as the lady earlier mentioned, man, I'm sorry, uh, mentioned. Um, when you have an entire household, um, the vaccine what comes, those vaccinated are going to come down along with the, the unvaccinated as well. All right. This is from Kristen. She says, please protect the kids in schools. Teachers and staff do not even wear masks. How is this following CDC guidelines, which recommend wearing masks? It's not. It's not. People aren't following it. Um, we got to wake up as a community. Uh, it's time to throw those masks on. Uh, if we have any hope of getting through uh, this next um, increase, um, of cases, uh, we've got to do everything it takes. Um, and you're right, people aren't doing it, which is where the whole debate of orders and mandates come from. So if people won't do it voluntarily, and the result it has a negative impact on each other and each other as a community. It's not just your choice, your body, it's your choice, everybody else's body too, right? So at that point, our laws or requirements than the only outcome. And uh, we as a health department have decided, if you will, to be forced into that decision um, based on what the data shows us. But we're really hoping that people do the right thing and choose to put their masks on. Um, there is no reason not to at this point. All right, Doc, it's 4.02 and we have several questions left. Do you want to keep going for a few minutes? Sure, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next question is from Chi Chi, who asks, who is enforcing masks on the school buses? Is it the responsibility of the driver? Do we know that? It's the responsibility of the company. So I would assume it'd be the responsibility of the driver, right? So it's the company who, um, the, the bus company, right? Just like it's a business. If a business needs to wear a mask, it's the business owner that is their onus is to do that. So um, I would report um, you, you can certainly kind of get us involved. We're still looking for where the best place is to report something that's uh, technically kind of a federal um, law. Um, these things are murky, right? But I would certainly start with talking to the bus driver, right? This is the first thing you do is like you talk to the individual. Look, I'd really like you to wear a mask. I'd feel safer with my kid. If that doesn't work, I'd call the business. Um, or you can call uh, the school and um, see if uh, they have a contract, right, with this, this, this bus company, and the school deserves to know as well that they're not following the law. All right, the next question is from TJ. Do you have any, st any statistics on how the Delta variant affects someone who is unvaccinated who has already had the original strain of COVID? <sighs> I don't, so have you, I have not heard that the Delta strain is more like, I think this is a reinfection question or is it a severity question? I think this is a reinfection question. So is the Delta strain more likely to reinfect somebody who had a previous infection? We're listening to Brandon, my informatics guy. Yeah. Okay, uh, unvaccinated group, again, much more likely to get reinfected, correct, than an unv unvaccinated person. So we know reinfection is real. Um, this is where all the booster discussions are coming from. Uh, we know it's rare. So that, that, that percentage is really what's still elusive. I have not seen two studies with the same 
percentage. I think it's really hard to identify reinfection unless it was documented both the original and then the second one. Um, so I'll keep, I'll keep, we'll keep that in mind. Uh, it's a great question. And I'm sorry, I can't be more uh, specific, but I'll go back to the fact that it consistently shows that even if you've had an infection in the past, being vaccinated uh, provides you better protection than just relying on the natural immunity from your previous infection. Okay. That has been shown consistently in all the studies. How much more, I think, varies from place to place, and it would probably vary on the variant as well. Um, but I, I can say that has been a consistent finding in all the uh, studies that I've looked at. So Jonathan asks, so if Quite I'm not back, so we can look at that more. Okay. I'm oh. sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Jonathan asks, Go ahead. so if, if I'm not vaccinated and you are, how do I put you at risk? Because you are much more likely to be infected, okay? And as a person who's much more likely to be infected, you're much more likely to transmit that virus to other people. Go back to the fact that you can have an infection and not have a lot of symptoms. And unless you're doing a lot of serial testing on yourself for the good of humanity, you're not going to know. So people who are unvaccinated are a risk to all the rest of us because you're perpetuating the viral transmission. Um, the virus is much more likely to be transmitted in unvaccinated people than in vaccinated people, statistically, just odds wise. Okay, so that's why. All right, Kristen asks, is there information on the percentage of staff that is vaccinated at each of our schools or is that at their discretion to release? That is at their discretion to release. I do not have that information. It's a good uh, question. Beth, Beth asks, the best preventative other than being vaccinated is wearing a mask, correct? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, when you look at the layered strategy, I think masks are, are there's no question masks are there. And it's and they're there because they're easy, they're cheap, they're safe, and we know they're they're pretty effective. Now, the effectiveness varies a lot by what kind of mask, um, you know, how well you're wearing it, how many people are wearing it. Uh, another really important factor, though, is ventilation. Okay, um, the, the flow of fresh air, this is why outdoor exposures don't seem to be really super high risk, although people do get infected from each other being outdoors. But um, uh, ventilation uh, really seems to dilute and reduce that viral load. A lot of our, our tendency to be infected is dependent on how much virus lands in your nose, right? How much you breathe in. So ventilation, mass vaccination. And uh, there is still a lot to be said about distancing because um, the virus can only um, go so far out on your respiratory droplets before it kind of drops out of the air. Remember, viruses don't fly around on their own. They, they attach themselves to respiratory droplets. And those droplets are relatively heavy the whole debate about aerosolized versus respiratory droplets, right? So respiratory droplets are a little bigger and they, they drop out of the air quicker. So if you're 10 feet away, even if somebody's spewing the virus out of their mouth, it may not reach you, okay? Which is why kind of keeping your distance when you're in a, a, a place where there's a lot of unknown people, especially if no one's wearing a mask, uh, keep your distance. Um, hand washing, all that stuff's important. Being healthy is important, you know, get your rest, eat right. Um, I have not yet seen any definitive studies on vitamin therapy and its impact on, on getting COVID or surviving a COVID infection. I know there's a lot of discussion about zinc and vitamin D. That's all pretty iffy right now. Um, so I would just say eat right. Um, make sure that you you nutritionally um, have a good nutritional balance and you're taking care of yourself and getting your rest because we know that that helps your immune system. So all those things put together improve your odds, right? It improves your odds. It's all about risk management. So, Doc, sort of along those lines, Beth, who asked the earlier question, she said she had a, sorry, but she wanted to comment on her question. She said okay. that they re uh, received the letter from her elementary school that came from the health department that they had a mm -hmm. positive case in the school. And the entire letter, it talked about hand washing and good hygiene practices, which are of course important, but it didn't mm -hmm. mention oh. at all anything about mask. And she was wondering, don't you think the in the letter, mask should be highly yeah. encouraged? It should be there. Uh, it might be an old letter, 
we'll have to look at that. And thank you um, for bringing that up. I know that there was a letter that was being used from way back in the initiation of this uh, before the vaccines were available, and it didn't mention vaccines either. So uh, we'll be happy to go back to that. And um, maybe you could type in what school you're in or what school district, because there have been a lot of iterations of these letters, and it's, it's possible that um, that wasn't updated. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. Uh, Dana asks, any comments on the research from the JAMA Journal of Medicine about the effects of masks on children? I'm assuming you're talking about the study on carbon dioxide levels with mask wearing, right? It was retracted. It's a really poorly done study. Um, we reviewed it a little bit. Um, and I will find that article and um, kind of give you guys a little rundown on it. But from my understanding, it was a crummy, crummy if non-existent methodology. Uh, they didn't study the important thing, which is carbon dioxide in the blood. And um, it was retracted from the journal uh, very shortly after it was published because of its poor quality. So okay, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't hang my head on that as proving that masks are bad. Again, I'll say this before, you can't cherry pick articles to prove your point of view. We, we don't have the luxury of doing that either. We have to look at the preponderance of evidence and expert consensus. So there are thousands and thousands of papers out there about masks, and some of them do uh, contradict each other. So you have to look at the overall burden of evidence and what it's showing, especially as we have a real life unfolding epidemic, uh, pandemic in our midst. It's kind of like building the plane, right, while, you're, while we're flying it, right? That's kind of what we're doing. We're building the plane while we're flying it. And there are inevitably going to be some missteps, but you still have to look at the body of evidence and you can't just pick one study and say, aha, I knew everything else was wrong. It's just not the way science works. All right, we have a few minutes left, so I'm trying to get to these questions. This is from Darlene. Uh, my brother and his wife got COVID. They had the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. EMS came to their house to give them the BAM IV, they called it. Is this a standard procedure? Brother was really ill, but the wife was not as ill. Yeah, so monoclonal antibody therapy, and we have a new one now to replace BAM. I think they're using Regen Cove um, because the BAM is now resistant um, to the Delta variant. Um, or excuse me, the Delta variant is resistant to the BAM. But monoclonal therapy um, is one of the few outpatient treatments available that has been shown to reduce hospitalizations in like 60% of the patients. This is not the same as like an antiviral therapy that significantly reduces um, um, serious illness. It's, it's just something that we have. Um, it appears to be very well tolerated. It's available at no cost to individuals. And we do have it available in our community. Ask your doctor for it. Um, and um, it is um, being provided in a number of ways. But um, kudos to our tri hospital EMS system who've been providing IV infusions of this now for um, a long time now and have really been instrumental in getting this in, into people uh, when they need it most. So I'm assuming that early BAM therapy, if you qualify, and it's not, not everybody's eligible. You have to be in a certain high risk category to receive it. Um, but that is more than likely preventing a fair amount of people from ending up getting hospitalized. It is not to be used once you're so sick, you need to go to the hospital. You got to use it early on in the course of your treatment. So if you think you have COVID, the right thing to do is get tested first. And once you know whether or not your test is positive or negative, reach out to your healthcare provider and talk to them about what your best course of action should be. All right, Marilyn asks, I hear Moderna vaccine is most effective, but Pfizer is the only one approved by the FDA. Is that true? <laughs> there was, um, There has been one study that shows um, a little bit higher efficacy um, but there's a lot, it was an observational study, and this goes back to what I was just talking about. You can't take one study and say, aha, this proves one thing. So we have two mRNA vaccines, both of which have been found to be extremely effective in preventing infection and more importantly, preventing severe infection and an amazingly safe profile. Um, there was also a study that recently came out that has reviewed all of the VARES, the vaccine adverse event syndrome data, and there wasn't a single flag 
of increased risk or outcomes with the exception of a very slight increase in that myocarditis for, for young men that's very small. So this is an amazingly safe vaccine. Um, so F, um, the FDA did get the full approval through with Pfizer. It was first. It was probably the first one um, to get the paperwork in. Moderna is in the um, hopper right now. It's I know that the paperwork was submitted 25th, I think, of August, something like that. This is bureaucracy, people. Whether or not these vaccines are approved officially through um, the, the um, previous, the, the standard process, or whether they've been available through EAU, the safety and research is the same, okay? It's just the amount of data that needs to be submitted and the amount of time that has to go by in order to get that full FDA approval. So I would not hesitate to get either one of these vaccines, I guess is my point. I, I, I wouldn't, and if you're really you know, stuck on FDA approval, get the Pfizer, that's great. Whatever it takes to get you uh, vaccinated is the right choice. All right, this is gonna be our last question because it's 4.15. And then anyone who we didn't get to, please email your questions to COVID-19 at sinclaircounty.org and we will answer those. Um, this is from Heidi. How do you explain to office staff that a positive COVID person has returned after 29 days since first symptoms and has had IV fusion and two negative tests is safe to be around? Wow, well, a COVID positive person can return after 10 days. Um, the studies are really clear about that. After day 10, from all, almost all immunocompetent individuals, um, there is no longer any viral shedding that could be contagious to other people. There are a handful of, uh, if a person is severely immunocompromised, that could extend out to 20 days. So I don't know the particular situation, but that's 20 days. So 29 days, this person is way past their infectious period. In fact, they're in a, in a, in a zone there that first three months after an acute infection where reinfections are considered really rare and so rare that in fact we don't require uh, quarantine after exposure in that first 90 days because we know people are so infrequently reinfected during that period. So this is probably the safest person you're going to find to be around, okay? <laughs> the safest people you can be around are the people who are recently infected um, or vaccinated, I will add. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't see any risk with that individual. So if you have coworkers that are really struggling with this, that are just kind of, you know, there's us, we have, seem like we have these two extremes. People are like way too afraid and then people who are like not afraid at all, and there's no respect for the intensity, uh, the importance of this virus. So I think somewhere we got to come together. And I would say if you have staff that are way too afraid, I, reach out to us, um, send us a couple emails. Um, maybe we can provide you some with information or literature. There's a lot of information maybe we could guide you to that um, would help your staff understand um, their real risk. Okay. And Doc, this will be the last question then. You can you said that last wrap time, up. I know, but you can maybe <laughs> okay. wrap your closing comments into this. <clears throat> Peggy wants to know, um, why can't this vaccine be mandatory like other childhood vaccinations? Because it's a process and it's a political process. So mandating vaccines is a political regulatory process. We have not mandated a vaccine now in decades. Um, so uh, Peggy, I, I, I honor your ideas and, and what it means. I, we do know one thing that mandating vaccines works. Um, it generally drives the vaccine rates up very, very effectively, uh, but it's a process that has to be discussed. Um, let's face it, these vaccines have been around less than a year. Um, we have to walk this walk. We, we have to do this process together. Um, I often say it's like two steps forward, one step back, um, but we'll get there. We'll get there. And maybe someday um, with if there's enough devastation from this, this virus, uh, maybe it will be inevitable that everybody um, gets vaccinated. But right now, I don't think we as a country um, are prepared uh, to go in that direction. Um, I think there are a lot of businesses that have considered it because when you have 10, 20 percent of your workforce out uh, with an infection, um, that can be pretty devastating to your bottom line. So lots of things to consider and um, we'll see where it goes. All right. We encourage everyone who didn't get a chance to get their question asked or who came in late to the show, email us questions at COVID-19 at sinclaircounty.org or you can call us at 810-966-4163. 
And we'll be back next Thursday at 4.30. Doc, any last comments before? Or excuse me, not 4.30, 3.30. Sorry. Um, any last comments before we say goodbye? Uh, I just want to tell everybody to hang in there. Um, I say this every time, but, you know, there's going to be good days and there's going to be bad days. Uh, but there is no question when it comes to an infectious disease, we are in this together, whether you believe it or not. So what happens to you and what happens to your family happens to everyone around us. And that's why um, we need public health and public health policy. So we're here to serve you. This has not been easy for any of us either. Um, and yet um, we're strong and we're, we're still here. So we're not going anywhere and we'll continue to do the best work we can. Um, and we'll see you next week. Um, we'll keep showing up until you guys don't need us anymore. Thanks a lot.